Now we've replaced the 5U4 tube that we had, which was a rectifier tube, a diode. We have replaced that with a 6146 amplifier tube, which is a power pentode. Now, diode, whenever you hear die, you think of two. And that's right, because it has two elements. It had a cathode and a plate. Actually, it had two plates because it's a, a full wave rectifier. The pentode has five elements. And the pentode would look like this. You notice in this pentode, which is different than the diode that we had before, the filament. The filament is not connected to, to the power supply that's going into, into the cathode and, and you know, conducting any massive amount of current. It's simply a heater. It's going to heat, I'm going to go back to that. Okay. It's going to heat that cathode to give off electrons. And you can see on top there's a plate. But you notice there's some other little screen things in there. The first screen that you see is connected there to pin 6. That is the grid 1. That's where we're going to put the signal. We would put the radio signal from the driver onto that element. And as I kind of described before, when you put something on that first grid, when it goes positive, it's going to accelerate electrons to the plate. When it goes negative, it's going to hold them back. But we're going to put a lot of voltage on this tube so that at the plate, in the plate circuit, we're going to see a huge amplification in the signal that we put on that grid. Then we come along and we put a suppressor grid in there. Well, sometimes electrons are going to hit that plate and the plate's going to, the electrons are going to bounce off. And we don't want that happening and bouncing around in our tube, so we accelerate them a little bit, okay? And then we have another element, which is the screen grid. Now, you can control the flow of electrons to the plate through that screen grid. But generally, it's a critical voltage that's put on there so that it, it maintains a uniform flow of electrons to the plate. Big tubes have all of these elements in them because they're handling a lot of current. And you don't want electrons flying around. You want them aiming in one direction. You want those electrons coming off of the cathode to be focused on going to the plate. They're going to make a beeline to the plate. You don't want them bouncing on and off of the plate. So we put those other elements in to assure that. Now I've put the 6146 in the tube tester and I've already set it. I'm, I'm just readjusting like I did before for the line voltage to make sure that I get a, a good reading. And I did check this out before to see how good this tube was. This is a new tube. And I'm going to press the, first of all, there's no gas in the tube. The filament has continuity. I can tell you that just by putting my finger on the side of the tube. It's warm. Other, in other places, in other literature, sometimes they use the term heater for the filament because that's the function that it's doing here, is simply heating the cathode. And then I'm going to press the test button. Oh, it's going right up to the end. That's good. Now, my manual said that it should be around 5,000 micromoles. And for some reason, I guess it's, it's wobbling a little bit. And also, as I'm pressing this button, if you notice over here on the tube tester, there's a light that's lighting. Well, this tube is, is taking more current than the other tubes. 
And that little light bulb is a fuse to protect the circuits because we could really, <laughs> we could really pull a lot of current through the power supply in the tube tester. And then we would have a problem. We'd either blow some of the components out. Do it again. We could pull some of the components out of the, of the tube tester and we wouldn't want to blow the power supply. There are other tubes that I have here tonight. I thought this, one of them was an interesting little tube. This, this, is, this is a common tube. This is a common tube that's used in the old audio amplifiers, but it's also used in amateur equipment. Uh, as I, I've seen in the, some of the old handbooks, you can make a, a transmitter with this. This is a 6L6 tube. This is a much smaller version. The 6146 can probably give you 60 watts out if you really load it and work it in the, in the right configuration. Okay? The 6L6 tube might be able to give you, oh, 20, 20, 25 watts normally. And you find this in a lot of stereo amplifiers back in the 60s and 70s. You notice the tube that I'm holding here, though, is different than the other tubes that I've used. This one here is metal. And interestingly enough, now I have, I've had this on the other tube tester, but I, it's not that hot. This is also a 6L6 tube. It's essentially the same tube. Maybe the configurations are a little bit different, but this one has a glass envelope. Now, in my background, I used to work with electronic organs, which deal with a lot of audio frequencies. And the metal tube was much better at keeping down hum and other kinds of scratchy interference out of the amplifiers. So these were preferred at one time. You probably never find these anymore. But eventually it was put into a big tube like the 5U4 that I showed you earlier and then reduced to this, which is a, a, a GB tube, in, indicating that it's this little glass envelope. It's the same tube. Yeah, the the parameters probably are just a little bit different, but it's not a big thing. And this tube tester that I have here, this is an old Heathkit tube tester. This tube tester here will, when I push that button, will actually put that tube in an operating circuit and cause all of the elements to have the voltages they need so that you can accurately measure what's happening on the output end of it, okay? This tube tester is very limited. They call it a dynamic tube tester. Well, this is a dynamic tube tester. But this one will measure the mutual conductance very accurately. This Heathkit tube tester will make sure that you got some, some uh, current going through the, the cathode plate circuit, but it's not going to be that accurate. And I'm going to put the test button on, and you notice that pops right up into the good range. Well, it showed it's a brand new tube. That's a brand new tube. And it's interesting because I showed you the outline, the schematic diagram, of the pentode tube, the 6146 and the 6L6 are both pentodes. They both have three grids, a cathode and a plate. But the 6146 can handle so much more current and, you know, a higher, much higher voltage, whereas the um, the 6L6 probably runs about 300, 350 volts maximum. I put this other tube in just to see how this is going to react. It's the same setting. It's moving up a little bit. I've had this tube for years. 
actually since the 70s, early 70s, and I've never, I don't think I've ever tested it. I'm going to set the line voltage up just a tiny bit, a smidgen. See, that's a doubtful tube. It's going up a little bit, but if I have to run the thing a half an hour till it warms up, it's not going to hang in there very well in the circuit. Anyway, I wanted to give you an idea this evening of just how these vacuum tubes worked. They shoot a beam of electrons. And we learned how to control those electrons. Today, we use a piece of solid state, usually silicon crystal, and they put some kind of doping chemical on it, and they make a very fine, thin, microscopic layer, and they put another element on it, another piece of crystal, and they hook wires to it, and we can run it right through the solid state, right through the solid material. Whereas the vacuum tubes required a space between the elements, and you had to get the voltages up. And because of the high voltages used and the heat generated by the tubes, there are other complications caused in the circuit. Capacitors change values when they're heated up and cooled and heated up and cooled and heated up and cooled. And eventually, it can lead to a breakdown. Resistors, when they're heated up and cooled a lot, all of a sudden, their values change. They lose their, their compression. A resistor is simply carbon granules and a binder holding it together with a certain amount of pressure to get the resistance that you're looking for. And when it's heated and cooled and heated and cooled, and remember, a lot of these amplifiers are used in places where the heat is down maybe most of the week, or periodically, like off at night or whatever, and the heat goes down to 20 or to, um, uh, you know, 50 degrees maybe, and then you turn it back on, and the heat on that, on that filament goes way up to, to, you know, 150, 200 degrees, and then all of a sudden it goes down the other way, and this has a lot of drag on the components. Whereas on solid state, you don't have that major change. And it's pretty consistent. Well, I thank you for spending this time with us. And, you know, if we run into each other at the club, ask me questions about the old vacuum tube days. If you have any vacuum tube equipment, we might, you might be able to bring it in here and we can work on it and we can figure it out. Have a wonderful day.